and with mocap <laughs> you know you're like one of maybe four people on set if if the if at all um I think the first few times I did it I was like the only one there all day and you're just doing stuff all day they like have a ginormous list of things like 96 shots or something they're like and like idols are great because you can just stand there and like whatever pick your nose for fidgets and stuff um but a lot of times you're like running back and forth or you're like throwing punches and kicks and like falling which wrecks on set and wrecks for mocap I think I, I still I'm still trying to figure out which one is worse because the amount of repetitions you do for mocap for like move sets for Rex is like, you know, you do the from the front, from the back, from the side, from the other side, but then you do like small, medium, large <laughs> like distances. And yeah, you get to fall on a mat, which is lovely, but on set you do it like three times. And then if they want another one, your like stunt coordinator's like, well, what's gonna cost you this much more? And so production's a little more careful about it. This is an interview with Tekla Hutirova. Tekla is a martial artist, a stunt woman, a motion capture performer, and an action designer for movies and games. And she's also a friend of mine. Tekla talks about how she got started doing stunts, her approach to movement, how she trains actors, and also the differences between stunts in movies and games. Well, let's, uh, let's just talk about uh, the Tekla story starting from the beginning. Tell us about your upbringing and where you were, what you were doing, what you were watching. Around 10 or 11, I started martial arts. Before that, I was kind of just an active kid. I climbed trees a lot and like rode bikes and things. Loved climbing trees. <laughs> um, but I actually went to martial arts originally because my mom had always wanted to do it as a kid growing up and she never ended up doing it. So she just like put me in as one of those things you do with your kids, I guess. And you're just like, oh, let's see if they like this. And apparently it stuck. <laughs> because I uh, now have a uh, second degree black belt in Taekwondo from a while ago. I got that at like first one I got it 15 maybe and then second degree was like 17 or something Um, and didn't didn't continue in Taekwondo specifically after that. I'd probably have more now but whatever. Um, Since then because after after that I I, uh, I was competing in sport karate a lot once I got my first degree black belt uh, so I went around to different tournaments um, around the US and in the world got a couple of world titles in sport karate um, and for those who don't know sport karate is basically like uh, almost like think of a gymnastics floor routine where you have like the dance elements which would be the martial arts and then you have like acrobatics and tumbling and there's there can be music to it so uh it's like a performance kata sort of competition an individual sport so I, I did that a lot uh competed around 2010 for a few years and then through that I met a lot of people who once they were done with sport karate and competing on the circuit they ended up moving to LA to pursue stunt work um so I that kind of put the bug into my head I also, at that point, was doing a bit of acting um, in Arizona, doing some student films and like a TV show pilot that I really liked. Didn't go anywhere, but it was a really great experience because um, I got to be the lead and that was like a cool thing to like experience and be a part of. And it kind of really got me going into just how much I like film because um, I, growing up, I didn't exactly watch a ton of like martial arts movies or anything I, I started that a little later once I actually got into like film and martial arts yeah I didn't I, I watched like Land Before Time and like Studio Ghibli movies um like some animated Japanese stuff and the, the martial arts side came in once I was more into film and fight choreography and stuff like that while I was thinking about maybe stunts maybe acting I also tried out for um Cirque du Soleil and I was in their database for quite some time and then naturally when I moved here to LA uh in 2015 in the fall they like it was it was so funny because I waited on their database for a while like almost a year maybe and then I was like whatever screw it and then I moved to LA and then they're like hey by the way like within two weeks of me moving they're like hey come to this audition like you and six other people for Ka. So I went to the audition and um, did that, but then ultimately made the choice to just stay in LA and, and pursue film, which I'm really glad I did. Uh, Cause obviously 
it's just there's more longevity in it and i like it more because it's there's there's always something new with film and video games and motion capture and stuff instead of just you know live show doing the same thing um but that's basically the backstory martial arts wise since before since taekwondo I'd, i've done a lot of other different ones so i've trained like boxing and jujitsu a bit of judo um a lot of wing chun and jeet kundo with uh, dan southworth who i know you know as well um and some muay thai and stuff like that when you're when you were training in taekwondo did you have your eyes set on being a stunt woman or was it purely for doing martial arts it was just to do martial arts and i, I was really i was really into competing and 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 the circuit and everything for a while because i did that pretty consistently and it, that was kind of the focus um yeah stunts wasn't even like I didn't even really I didn't think about it like I knew some people existed and stuff obviously but I it was just martial arts for martial arts sake and and tricking um like the martial arts acrobatics mm -hmm. element for for that I, I got a lot of like positive attention obviously because not too many girls in martial arts and tricking and everything so I definitely enjoyed being one of the few people that do a thing and fairly well so um I think I was just kind of in the moment with that what was the emphasis that your teacher put on the Taekwondo training? Yeah. Um, I think I, I lucked out cause we had a really good, well-rounded sort of system. Like we, um, it was, it was based in Junri Taekwondo. So a more modern approach. So a lot of our forms and stuff at the beginning were like standing up straight. And then we got into low stances later and whatever, like Grandmaster Junri kind of set the whole system up. Um, but that was the base and then we also did like weapons class where we just learned random weapon stuff and had forms with those which was like added in by my instructor I think and then we also did um like so it was like we had different days that we did different things so it was like a forms day sparring day self-defense day and um like combos and kicks and stuff day so they were all pretty well organized I hated sparring as a kid because obviously I'm not the tallest person and that probably would have helped <laughs> um I like it a lot more now just like the idea of it and stuff um it was cool because it was it was based in taekwondo but um we'd have like random people pop in and like like there's like a kung fu guy that came and sparred with us sometime and there was a boxer that came and trained and kind of like took us through drills sometime and then by the end of it um there was a couple jujitsu people that were coming in and and working with us on some stuff so it was, it was actually really cool because it was less just taekwondo it was a more well-rounded sort of school and that was actually a really good background um but you could also kind of just focus on what you wanted after a while because i was you know teaching there after i got my black belt and then um even before because you have to teach to get like some of the belts and stuff but um, my friends and I had a key to the studio, so we'd come and train. So you can kind of just focus on whatever you want at some point. Is that where you uh, learn gymnastics to go into sport karate as well, or did that come later? Um, at the start, it was that we had like a Friday afternoon, like tricking class, um, like flips class, and we'd set up just like old tumbling mats and kind of uh, we'd learn like back handsprings and like backflips, and he'd like spot us and stuff and. People were, work, were working on like butterfly twists and corks, but like it was one of the like older school training where it's not like, oh, like, I don't know. I feel like now we just break it down so much better. It's like, oh, get your gainer really good, like for cork or what? It's like, get your gainer really good when you're upside down at this exact angle, like twist is super easy and kids at like seven learn it. But before it was kind of just like, ah, uh, it's kind of like a butterfly twist, but like kick your leg up and then just twist more and then come into it like this it took me forever to get Ariel down because my instructor would just be like, jump harder. <laughs> like that was his only note. <laughs> and he was, he was good at teaching, but he was kind of self-taught with like flips and everything. So it was just funny that I didn't jump and like, obviously other like notes might've helped a little better, but it was the same. I don't know. It was just like that old school, like backyard training sort of thing. And it was funny. So it was kind of in the early stages of even developing a vocabulary for this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in my at my school for sure, uh, loop kicks on like in in the bay and stuff had existed for a bit, and I eventually like found um, the camp and everything. So I went to that a few different times and like more gatherings and stuff. But at the beginning, yeah, like when I first started, uh, I know there were obviously other people doing it because it was like 
what I must have started in like 2005 six or something I don't know so um around that time so it's already obviously been around but we weren't as aware of it and I think everyone at, around that time even like if they hadn't seen videos online or anything which there were like bilang and stuff like that um <laughs> but I think people just were kind of inventing it independently it's so funny how things just like random groups of people are like oh what if I did this kick but jumped and spun instead and like they might not know that other people have names for it and like have already done it but they also invent it simultaneously it's so weird how how that works and then then they have to decide on a common name right yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and then also there was a like a tumbling class that a friend of mine's sister the gymnastics place that a friend of mine's sister went to so they had like a tumbling class and we made friends with the coach and kind of traded information and just you know trained with friends for the most part but the beginning was all at the at the taekwondo school, which is pretty cool. Did your taekwondo training help you with sport karate, or did you have to break some habits? I think it helped a lot, um, cause it's not. Yeah, I think it helped a lot, cause it's sport karate is like very linear, uh, and and just like fast hands and whatever, um, with like a lot of front stances and stuff. And I think taekwondo being as basic and simple in its movements as it is kind of helped um it made it a little harder to kind of come up with like more complex hand choreo like as as opposed to if I'd done like kung fu or something maybe my combos would have been cooler or something but um yeah I I think it was actually a pretty good solid base for it so how do you how do you come up with hand choreo in a sport karate set is there is there criteria like what what is like how does all that work I'm always curious about those hand things that they do there's zero criteria broad broader broader question how do you come up with choreography in general in sport karate yeah there's kind of as i was gonna say like there's kind of a format of like you walk up you say your intro you walk back you want to like be three quarters of the way to the left or the right of the ring and you do like a hand combo which ends up being five to ten to fifteen different just moves from a set like there's there's like chop punch there's chop under chop punch chop ridge chop punch like those are very standard like you kind of have these like little combo sets that just end up being places so it's like putting blocks together of that so it's like hand combo then whichever side of the ring you ended up on you end up doing like a tricking pass or like some kicking pass or whatever um and then you do usually another hand combo end up on the corner and then it's always around a flash kick people have tried doing more interesting tumbling passes but the judge is always like a nice high flash kick so like it was really funny because like people would do the round off flash kick on the corner um and then after a while like in the sport people would try to do round off back handspring back handspring double full or something and inevitably the sport just went back to just doing a high flash kick <laughs> um because it's more impressive for some reason so then you land you do another hand combo you do like two kicks to the middle and then maybe another hand combo and you're done so that's basically like there's very often a layout like a blueprint of like where your things are um and I think in general I kind of have, have taken that into how I create choreography is just like map it out first like the broad strokes, you're like, oh, you end up here. Like even in, in fight scenes that I'm, you know, starting to work on like fight choreographer stuff. Um, I like to have a, n- n- the knowledge of what the area is like first. So it's like, oh, they come in the door, something happens, they end up on the wall and just like walking that and then filling in those beats, I feel like is is um a good way to do that. I know some people maybe probably do it the other way and they're like, oh, this would just be like a really cool beat. And then figure out where that goes but for me it's probably because of the way sport karate forms were always like made I think it's easier to just map out stuff first was there a part of performing the choreography that that you excelled at that you really tried to exploit for yourself when you're doing sport karate I mean I, I always did more of the extreme forms which is the things with flips like there's creative forms and there's extreme forms extreme forms you can like go upside down and rotate more than 360 degrees in the air that's like one of the only rules that exists and creative you can't so I always did more of the extreme divisions because I could flip and I was one of the fewer girls in the circuit that was like fairly good at that um so that was kind of my strength for the most part 
do you fall back on various other techniques with action? Like, is your action high flying as a result, or do you do a whole bunch of other stuff as a result? I think as a result, I try to go completely in the opposite direction because I like, unless, uh, yeah, I think I just did so many flips and stuff. And obviously, like, one of the draws of me as a performer, at least originally, was acrobatics and stuff. So, I got hired to do flips and and things for you know it's it's really cool but I do find that when I try to design action I try to avoid it as much as possible and like I really kind of try to think about if it makes sense then I'll put it in um but if there's something better and easier I'll kind of try to go towards that and also just you know um for designing action it's like it has to serve the story so <laughs> depending on what that character might be like some people just love putting flips in for flip's sake and it's like oh it's this kid she's the girl next door but she just did a 720 kick like uh maybe not but if she you know had some martial arts training and it comes out of nowhere and it surprises them and like if it serves the story and it kind of makes sense within that it then yeah it's fun and I like it but you most of the time I kind of try to go more like jikundo boxing based stuff maybe a kick um but i try to just do more like the realistic yeah thing because i like it better and it makes more sense to me and i just do not like flips for flips sake <laughs> do you find that when you get hired to design action they say oh tecla is this amazing flipper and then you design a bunch of action that has almost no flips is there any pushback that you have to then you have to kind of like find your way through that have you ever gone through a trial like that um I haven't been hired that much for designing action yet so I'm sure I'll run into that at some point um most of the time so far like even as a performer too like if I just do like an aerial or something like they're pretty happy with like the more basic things they're like wow that's super cool sometimes the simple stuff with less twists actually look more impressive especially to the um common viewer or whatever um, so you don't have to end up doing as much of the complicated things as you'd think. Nice. Um, but yeah, I'll eventually find people that are like, oh, well, we hired you because of flips and stuff. But, you know, as long as you come from a place where you're true to the story and just like listen to the director and the writers and stuff, or if, if the writers are there, um, mostly like listen to the director and kind of see what their vision is and like what the characters are. It's just you got to ask the questions. And then I think as long as it's based on whatever the answers were it helps obviously there's people that don't necessarily know what they want in which case that kind of ends up being a trial and error but yeah definitely work with those directors that what they they say they say something like well like you know it'll be on a video game they'll say i want the flippy you know the the, the three the three flips in the air and yeah they'll say stuff like that and you go like dang three flips all right let's let's see we gotta bring someone in to do a triple back you bring in a circ performer and they do a triple back and they're like whoa whoa i thought i thought he was just gonna do you know the backflip <laughs> thing <laughs> so uh <laughs> sometimes yeah. sometimes they sometimes in their head they're seeing something that they don't have the words for <laughs> yeah <laughs> And then when you give them the words for it, they say, oh, yeah, a, a front roll. That would be great. And then they're happy with that. <laughs> that triple backflip front roll. Great. Yeah. No, for sure. Or they'll like, they're always just like, oh, like something like the raid, you know, which just translates to like martial artsy. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's just really funny how, how people kind of latch on to certain concepts that they don't necessarily actually want, but that's their like point of reference and that's all they've got. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you'll you'll get like, uh, oh, we want, um, you know, yeah, like ongbok style, which to them means jumping high sometimes. Jumping, like to, yeah, like us, in some way. Yeah, yeah, a high jump. Whereas, like to us as stunt performers, when we think ongbok, we're like, dang, we gotta do real contact, okay? And then we do right. real contact. They go, oh, we didn't want. Yeah, it's like that's how they filmed it. <laughs> yeah, or you, people used to say like, um, born like born style fight and it's like that's more of a camera direction than a choreography direction because you can't tell what the choreo is i mean this brings up an interesting point though i when you when you're talking to directors and you know they say stuff like that they say we want born style fighting we want raid style fighting what kind of questions do you ask in those situations you know i, I think you just make examples a little bit you're like oh, okay so like something like 
you know, like if it's the raid or whatever, it's like, okay, so you want more like trapping where people end up in like weird positions and you move them around other people and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or they're like, no. Um, in which case you're like, oh, okay, so Ongbok, like you want a lot of like elbows and knees um, within it. And it, I think as long as you kind of just like break it down a little bit more to like the component parts, you can figure it out. Also, I mean, you know, I know you, you do a lot of previs and stuff and try to push that as much as you can, but that helps a lot um, just to kind of have a little bit of time to make something and maybe a few different versions of something and then show it to them because talking about it maybe one thing they're like no we don't want knees but like you know whatever um but then you show them like what it would look like with knees and without knees and they're like oh great this is perfect um you know i think previs is very helpful for that sort of communication as well so when you started out doing stunts um did you find yourself getting involved in previs quite a bit oh yeah one of my first big jobs was um I'm, the first big job was uh previs for logan um, so I was on that for months, just kind of going back and forth. Um, and obviously for feature films, like they have a lot more time than TV and video games as well, uh, which is funny because video games hypothetically have way more time than film, but it's different. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we did we did previs on Logan for a f several months and just like the fight choreographer, Steve Brown, was just like editing it all together, sending it to the stunt coordinator who sent it to the director who gave us a ton of notes and then we reshot a bunch of stuff and then did it all over again and make it pretty much exactly how they want it and then it's so much easier to shoot on the day in that time when you're doing logan was your job figuring out the action language of the main the co-star at the beginning you think it's one way and at the end is it something totally different um I mean, I know Garrett originally hired me because I could do flips. So that was cool because that character, for that character, it makes sense. There's always characters that are like superheroes or whatever. And she's little too. So her doing flips and bouncing from person to person and stuff like that reads with the story and everything. So that makes sense. We just ended up workshopping a lot of different movements and things. And a lot of the, like Steve Brown already had an idea of how she should move in a way and then um Manny Manzanares was on that as well doing um he was on camera doing the editing and the well they were both doing editing I don't know um but he was on camera and kind of directing that aspect of it so they both had you know some idea of how to do all of the stuff and um I was fairly new like that was like one of my first that was like a few months into me being in LA um because they were filming at XMA for the previs and I was working there. So at some point, um, Mike chat just told them that they should try to meet me and it worked out really well. So it was really cool. Uh, but yeah, I think action wise, I mean, stuff, it definitely changes, especially cause I had no previous, like it, the style was a little different from what I'd done at all. Um, so just finding different movement and the, the intentions different between performing sport karate or whatever um and like performing with other people and stuff but yeah it's just uh, I don't know I, if it changed much um from what they originally thought yes and no because I think you just end up giving them so many options and things that like some stuff gets cut but a lot of it just gets either improved or or figure out something from another option that didn't necessarily work but then you fill it fill it in later yeah, well, it it's such a long, convoluted process at times too. Like, did the director give direct notes? Did the DP ever come? Like, did did no no, no director, no DP. We sent them stuff, and they went back. And I, 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 I wonder which is better because obviously they had other stuff to be working on. Um, so it's nice that they didn't have to. Maybe they were there like once. I don't know. I don't think they. I don't think they ever came. Um, and I know some people enjoy that having not having them there they think that's better because you can you know kind of just work and and make all the stuff without someone being like actually ooh and whatever and like it kind of keeps the process going a lot faster but then on the other hand I know other people and I think you like the directors and stuff as involved as much as possible as well um as soon as possible 
because then you just don't end up having to do as much because you can just talk with them. I think there's a good like middle ground, like maybe they show up in the morning and then like halfway through the day for an hour. But it also depends on the director. Like and some of the directors like we've worked with on video games and stuff, like they're really good about just saying what they want and then letting the process happen, which is obviously the best case scenario. Like JJ once told me, you gotta be careful who you get in bed with. And <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like sometimes and sometimes too they'll take the previs and they'll say yeah great job awesome they take the previs and then you look at the movie and you go uh oh, where is it where's all the stuff we did oh, <laughs> I see a move or two but <laughs> you never know yeah or then it's like exactly the previs. yeah i honestly like dp should definitely be at least watching because a lot of times they're like so good at lighting and like the minutia of like the, the technical stuff, but then camera movement and whatnot. Like stunt people always do this thing where they film previs on this tiny little camera and they do all these crazy moves and flip it in the air and catch it and juggle it. And then you get like on set and it's a steady cam and like you can't do half the stuff that we previs. And it's like back to the like, is it a choreography note or a camera movement? and like style note like that should definitely it, it's it always ends up being better if if that's taken into account i think 100 percent. i learned that the hard way on altered carbon i totally i shot it like a hong kong movie and i was just getting shots wherever i wanted looked grand, looked fantastic and then they i saw the first episode and it just hit me i was like of course they couldn't do that <laughs> there's no way they would have time to shoot like that yeah especially tv as well i think like because i did a agents of shield like Haley Haley Wright and I did a big fight um and we you know we had it all set up all cool and there was like there was a bunch of like dodges and like close calls and misses and like rolls and stuff and seeing the cut because all they did was just do a few passes of like steady cam and then I think it was on tracks too the fight that they end up ended up cutting was completely out of order and like there was like a dodge and a dive roll and then like something else happened there was another roll like <laughs> it was all over the place and they of course had to intercut with all the passes with the actors and like it was just completely not not the right thing so I think like if we keep in mind all of the situation that like how how it's going to be filmed when we do previs I think we can give them a much better mm, idea product whatever that they can actually follow but yeah like how you said like there's no way that they would be able to do it the way you'd shot it even if they love it because of just technology that's great <laughs> advice they... thanks for thanks for that because i think i think a lot of i think a lot of the time um you know guys like me we get into previs and we think like oh great we can do whatever we want and then you get a reality check when it ends up not being the case so yeah especially with tv i feel like film like features are a little easier with that because they can kind of find the whatever like they have more of a budget and more time so sometimes they like make it work but yeah tv for sure it's so funny and then of course stunt people were always like ah they're not gonna follow the previews anyway it doesn't even matter we'll just make the best action and then see what they make and it's like <laughs> is that is that the beast? I mean, that's not, it's kind of an unanswerable question. It's like, oh, should we try and make this system more economical? It's like, why make what more economical? Yeah, I do like how um, it seems to work in video games because we do really try to like communicate better with the um, the rest of the production and, and kind of focus on like more detail stuff because they end up being able to move camera and like do all these things but I think just communicating more ahead of time and kind of giving them options and they tell us what they can or can't do like having that at least just like a meeting or something like beforehand helps a lot and I think with stunts like that doesn't happen very often in in live action stuff and that might be a benefit <laughs> when did you get into motion capture yeah, I did motion capture on Alita and Pacific Rim too for like features. Um, and that was definitely different from video games in its in its own way. Um, but yeah, for video games, I Sony found a video of me doing like both staff stuff that I actually had filmed for a uh, Cirque du Soleil audition that they wanted me to film and I'd uploaded it on YouTube and just left it there. And they were um 
they were looking for someone to do Valkyrie stuff in the first God of War. Or not the first one, um, the one before this one. It's not even remotely the first one. They call it, <laughs> they call it God of War 2018. Um, but yeah, so they just randomly brought me in from a YouTube video and that's kind of how it all started, which is so cool. And it's it's true what they say, like once you're kind of in motion capture, like it you just end up being moved around to different studios. Somehow people just like find out. <laughs> and then I yeah, I just got like different calls from different studios, but mostly mostly Sony Santa Monica. I've still worked the most for them and then this little place called Super Alloy. Uh, which Never seems like a metal working place, but it's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so, so fun of YouTube. <laughs> I was discovered. <laughs> yeah, same here. So when you when you first went and did a um, mocap shoot for God of War 2018, uh, what was that process like compared to working on a stunt shoot in a film or on TV? Yeah, I mean the most dramatic difference is how much you're moving and how little other people there are and how little downtime there is I think um especially like an in-game shoot obviously if you're doing cinematics and there's actors with face cam and stuff like it's a little more slow paced than you kind of end up doing but you still do a lot more than than normal because like on a tv show or movie like there's so much downtime like you get in in the morning at whatever super early um, you go through makeup, hair and all that, you eat your food, you hang out in your trailer, you usually have lunch because they're not ready for you yet. And then like eventually in the afternoon, sometime you, they're like, all right, go ahead to set and blah, blah, blah. And like you wait around for the scene to happen and then you jump in and you do your one wreck or like the fight if, if you've done a fight. Um, and they usually just like, you know, you do the swapping with the actors and you like do the fight with the actor and you do the fight with the other stunt person. And then you just like watch and that's like a busy day like if there's a fight that's a busy day like you're on set for the fight and like you do the pass with the other double then you do it with the actor and then like you watch your actor and, like make sure they're doing stuff great um otherwise like if you just have a wreck or something like you go in in the morning you wait around all day have a lot of crafty and then you go in and do your wreck usually right after lunch because somehow that always ends up happening um and then, yeah, like you do your thing, you wait to get released and then you're done. Um, and with mocap, <laughs> you're it's like, yeah, it was so surprising that it's like it's, you know, you're like one of maybe four people on set. If if the if at all, um, I think the first few times I did it, I was like the only one there all day and you're just doing stuff all day they like have a ginormous list of things like 96 shots or something they're like and like idols are great because you can just stand there and like whatever pick your nose for fidgets and stuff um but a lot of times you're like running back and forth or you're like throwing punches and kicks and like falling which wrecks on set and wrecks for mocap I think I, I still I'm still trying to figure out which one is worse because the amount of repetitions you do for mocap for like move sets for Rex is like, cause you know, you do the, from the front, from the back, from the side, from the other side, but then you do like small, medium, large <laughs> like distances. And yeah, you get to fall on a mat, which is lovely, but on set you do it like three times. And then if they want another one, your like stunt coordinator's like, well, what's going to cost you this much more. And so production's a little more careful about it. Um, so you don't end up doing it as much. Obviously, you usually don't land on a pad, but like three times versus a lot more, you know, so it's like, especially with like head reactions and stuff. So it's, it's always interesting. I'm still trying to figure out which one's worse. <laughs> did, did you find yourself pushing back at some point? Because there is a tendency, and I think I understand why they do this, where, you know, you've got you for eight hours, you're a stunt performer, so we're doing reactions <laughs> that's what yeah. we do for eight hours yeah exactly um I think I was really lucky because like with Sony and some other places that I worked with at the beginning they kind of like they made me pace myself because I was I was in it you know I'm like oh, I'm doing motion capture like everyone wants to get into this um it was, it was like still a cool thing I was like this is awesome um so I was just like yeah whatever we're fine let's go like 
good to go. We, you know, let's get it. Um, now I kind of push back a little bit. Um, you know, I'm like, oh, let's get the eight incher instead of the four. Like, you know, just because you, you already know like what they need and what what will help them get it the best. But yeah, you definitely learn like what to pace yourself with and everything. It is interesting though, the things that they think are difficult. If I do like an aerial or like a flip or something, they will kind of make sure that it's, you know, I don't have to do it a lot of times. And like, but then with Rex, they're like, ah, let's do like, you know, you got hit in the pinky, do an HK. It's like, <laughs> so it's just interesting. Like the, the, the stuff that's actually higher impact, um, they don't necessarily find to be more difficult so sometimes it's just also just talking to them and being like all right so this is like a thing I don't want to do this too many times um because of this and like you should keep this in mind for other people and and I think they do learn a lot as well just like from that because they, they want to help you know and they want their the best performance so if sometimes they just don't know have you found them overall pretty receptive to that kind of feedback yeah I think so um even if you just, you know, generally you just like ask if like to see the shot list or what, like a lot of times they'll kind of ask like, oh, do you want to do, you know, runs right now? Or do you want to warm up first a little bit and do it? Um, Cause it's obviously, it doesn't matter what order you shoot in cause it's just files. Um, so the, yeah, I feel like usually they're pretty, they're pretty good with like communication and stuff like that. But I also think I've worked for really good studios um, and I know that's not always the case. One of my um, first mocap games was um, Mafia 3 and uh, Stan, <laughs> Stan Hom was directing it and he would always ask, like, like, do you need a break? Do you need a break? And I said, no, I, I don't need a break. And uh, of course, I'm young. I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to say it because I want the job and I want them to keep bringing me back. Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely, yeah, as part of that. And there's a bit of an ego thing, like, you know, whenever, because I think Stan was just always like, you don't sweat. You never sweat. I'm like, Psh whatever you know and it, it kind of feels good to be like that you know robot creature that's like super you know invincible especially if you're young and stuff but I think the trade-off that they get with someone who maybe complains a little more not complains but like who maybe like stops them at a certain point is that we now know more about what they need and how to get it more efficiently like now I ask so many questions before we even roll because it's like you know, you need to know what's happening before you need to know what happens after you fall or do the moves or whatever. Like, do you want to return to idol? Do you want to stand up? Do you want me to stay there? So like all the stuff that I maybe before would have just done. And then they're like, Oh, that was great. But you stood up too soon or whatever. Like now I'm just like, okay, let me like exactly what this is. And then you usually do it in one or two takes, which is like th that trade off is I think a benefit to them you know just like having those questions asked and you know knowing which questions to ask very well put that's a great lesson for anybody who wants to get into mocap <laughs> know uh, which questions to ask yeah and uh and yeah take your time um mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a tendency like when i did avengers they brought me in and um and i just i just said like can we just talk about the character and we talked for about like an hour and a half and they just showed me video they yeah. wouldn't have done this otherwise but they were yeah. actually excited to do it so I didn't come in with any preconceived notions to me. It was like, let's just learn. And, right. And then we ended up getting like first or second take every time. Yeah. Because if you understand what the performance is and also it helps them as well, because they don't have to figure out how to give you notes about something like the minutia, you know, the, and rather like they can just kind of give you a general feeling and you kind of get it. Because otherwise, you know, you do get kind of trapped in this like weird cycle of like them over detailing and you not getting it what exactly what they want. And like, so it's nice that, you know, Avengers took the time with you to to show you the character ahead of time because it is so much more efficient in the long run. Yeah, I mean, that's good. That's good advice for a mocap director. What you said they're in such a state of mind where they know the combat system and they're looking for like a movement that kind of fits nicely in there, but they, sometimes they don't detail the stuff that needs to come before the movement and the stuff that needs to come after it. So like you said. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And like, yeah, the wind up or the, yeah. Cause they'll be like, Oh, I just need like this bit, but like the energy of this versus like, you know, actually like winding up for it or ending it. Yeah. That ends up being different and then they don't quite get what they need even though it might seem like redundant is like having a stunt coordinator there. There's so many different types of 
people that um animate like I think there's you know like I I might work really well with someone who's super detail oriented whereas someone else might work really great with someone who just gives them like an energy and like uh you know directs them throughout the whole shot it's nice to have someone to be there to translate it to the performer yeah that would be a great that would be a great addition to any shoot i agree with you so while you're doing motion capture you're also doing traditional stunts you're doubling a lot of people too how do you look at a performer to double them properly what's the whole process for that for you um i usually don't double leads so i don't have that much to go on um as far as like how the person moves and stuff like if, if it was a more established character you know you'd look into how that character and how that person walk and like move and things because there's there's certain details that you want to catch um you know like how they hold their hands and it, if they're in a fighting pose if that's been established before um and stuff like that but usually i i kind of double uh guest stars and like smaller roles um so it's not as I just don't have as much to go on with that. There's like a collaboration because like it, as a stunt person, you end up doing the previs, learning the fight and all that before the actor even gets it. So we end up being able to influence their movement a little bit um, in just like, oh, like make sure, you know, when you do the stance, like you stand here and your hands are in this certain position or whatever. But then they always in inevitably like forget it. So kind of while we're training with them, you know, just taking notes on, how they end up doing stuff um, and seeing what their like default is. Cause you know, obviously they have a lot on their mind and on their plate. Like they've been shooting all day. They were like, they're probably before you, they're going to be there after you're done. Um, so just kind of making it as easy for them as possible uh, is very helpful. And I think, you know, when stunt coordinators and action directors and stuff understand that it helps a lot. Again, it comes down to like understanding the character and like, if you can, read the description, if you can read the scene, um, that always helps a lot. A lot of times, like if you're just doubling, um, you're not gonna be doing a lot of the like locomotion stuff for them or anything. Like you're not gonna be like moving, walking from place to place. You like end up doing the fight, which is already preset or you end up doing a wreck. Um, and then like you might get up how they would or whatever. <laughs> But yeah, if it was like a longer character, you definitely want to study how the actor moves and like how they even just like how they hold their hands and like just watch like the little details of um, what they're like. But I haven't experienced that as much as like someone else might. Is training an actor the same thing as training a martial artist in a martial arts school? No, because you can't give them 40 pushups if they don't listen. You just can't. <laughs> um, no, uh... I think you have to be a lot more mm, open to their interpretation than in martial arts. Um, and even just how I train people in general martial arts now versus like before when I was like teaching as a kid or whatever. Um, I think it all, it's, it's changed a lot. Like I let people do more of what they feel and what they want more nowadays um, than I used to. I was always just like, Cause you know, you grow up in a system and they're like, oh, this is how you punch. And it's like, okay, this is the only way to punch. Um, but it's obviously not. <laughs> um, and I think in, in, especially in like action and, and stuff, like there's so much room for interpretation and like personal style that you can kind of leave it a little open-ended. So it's definitely different training actors versus training people, but it also depends on how much time you have with them. Like if they want to train just to train, you can have a little more of a traditional background for them um if I can I always try to make actors like hit pads um like punch a bag or like a kicking pad or whatever just to feel how it feels to actually make impact with something um that's like a big one for me I think just because there's such a big difference between throwing a punch and like hitting something because that stop um that adds a lot of power behind things and like intention behind moves that they wouldn't necessarily even understand or know about um, but when you only have them for a little bit, like on set or whatever, you kind of just end up, like, especially for TV, you kind of just end up teaching them the moves. Honestly, try to give them as little impact and feedback as possible just to not confuse them and then try to make sure that they're connected with their acting 
in it and like that their face and like you know everything like if they're supposed to be scared or if they're supposed to be you know more more of the performance and less about the moves because they'll always do a pass with the doubles for the moves and they can always cut back and forth but if their performance isn't there and their intention isn't there um that's a problem so you just focus on different things i think when you have them for different lengths of time do you think that there's anything that stunt performers can learn from actors when it comes to fight scenes then oh yeah um i think just the intentionality and like the connectedness to the acting and the character itself like a lot of you know stereotypically like stunt people just don't know how to act which is not really true but that's how like you know it used to be and there's definitely some stunt people that you can see that and they just do the movement and it's robotic and stuff and there's less like connection to the performance and to the action and there's there's not like oh this is a desperate punch or like you're super in control in this moment like there's just less dynamic I think than with with actors um and actors just know how to like go all out and make it look like they're trying to hit you because they usually are <laughs> um no but uh yeah I think as, as stunt people we try to like always hold a little back which is good in a way like the little tiny bit like you don't want to go 100 percent all the time like you know you want to be able to like pull a punch at the last second but you also want to make it look like you wouldn't be able to so I think just finding that balance of like making sure that the performance is there and a lot of that's like face I think um just selling it like with the looks and like your facial expressions and stuff because uh and also just like yeah just like intention actors have a lot better intention than than a lot of some people I think it's a great point because I find that I I I end up sort of trying to teach <clears throat> the opposite of actor training when it comes to mocap where uh, a martial artist will come in and they're very they're very, you know, precise and they can hit a mark and that's great. Um, usually an animator is looking for something that's way more human than that. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like, I think motion capture, especially like people would rather, like there's obviously a balance again, but I think animators would rather have someone that might not necessarily be able to like hit the mark exactly every time, not in game, but just in general versus someone who can't stand there and breathe like a human because like that's the only thing that we that they need us for really is like our breath and our like <laughs> life force and our like slight intricacy of like fidgeting and stuff like they want all of that because that's the only part that they really need like they can make a character like arcane's a perfect example like they can make characters look like they're you know like the punches and everything like animation is really good at that but like the subtle of just like like that's harder to animate because you have to find where that starts and everything like it's easier to just have someone be there breathing versus trying to animate it especially in a loop and stuff but yeah it's it's hard to teach that I couldn't put it better myself um can you talk about doing mocap in games uh you've done mocap in movies as well and performance capturing games is there a different movement style associated with those and what's the process difference between those um with movies well alita they just had us in suits and then cameras uh set up but with also they had also a set so like the it was like a, a giant volume with a set in it which was really cool um so that kind of ends up shooting more like a movie. Alita also had like live action elements. So I think that's why. But the other times it, we were just in a motion capture studio. Um, so it kind of felt the same. Uh, we were just doing like big fights and stuff and week of rehearsal or something just because it's a movie, you have more time. So like you make it up, you do all the stuff. And then the day you're shooting it, you put the suits on and then you just do all of it um, in a row. So it feels a lot more just like regular motion capture. Um, Alita was the different one for sure because it was, there were different suits. It was like the whole, everything was connected. It was like a closed system. Like all the markers were connected by uh, cables and stuff to whatever, like this pack on your back. Um, so it was just a completely different system. So that was, that one felt different. Uh, and then you also asked about like in-game versus cinematic. Yeah, and just the the way that you move 
like if you were to throw a punch mm-hmm. in an end game scenario versus in a cinematic oh is, yeah is there a different thought process for that yeah i think there is because in game you want like the goals are different right like in game you want it to be clean and something that you can repeat and something that you can see like there's a lot more um detailed thought that goes into like exactly what the move should be like you have to start at point a you have to go all the way across um you're usually aware that there's a camera behind you so you can't really do small movements that don't read for the camera because then the player has no idea what they're doing and that goes doubly for any pov video game because i just did uh one where we just did a bunch of move sets from POV, so you have to make sure it goes through camera. So it's a lot more mechanical, I'd say. Um, and then also just, you know, making sure that you start an idol, you do your move, you end an idol. Like it doesn't feel as real and as like acty, I guess. Um, except that you still have to bring the acting and the intention into that one moment, but then you also have to keep thinking about like the technicality of it so it's a weird little like half and half um which i find pretty cool because it's like when you can ride that line it's pretty neat but it's it probably the more challenging of it in a way it's more challenging because you have to bring the acting but then you also have to know exactly where you're going to end and land and come back to and like people tend to forget that um like they'll like get so into the move and like do the move and they're like yeah and then they're like oh no idle um so just having all that in your head, I think it's a lot more complex. Uh, but then cinematic, I think you can be a little more in character. Cinematic feels almost like uh, like a theater performance in a way. Cause, and and um, I worked on a Star Wars Fallen Order and I think the director for that was actually like a live stage director. So a lot of, um, it was weird seeing him work but a lot of what he did kind of felt like like we did like theater warm-ups <laughs> like which was silly but kind of nice uh, <laughs> but a lot of just like how he built the scene and like rehearsed it um felt kind of like live live performance theater and like you know you do your action and then you like walk to this point and they're like oh is this where you're gonna be cool so then they like mark it um but it's not as it's not as specific I think and it's it's a little more open and and free flowing and then doing fights for that that can be difficult because sometimes when we're just like doing fights for a scene that was already shot or whatever um you know we have to start in like a weird pose like great start here do some moves that we make up and then like pause in this position (laughs) and then like do more moves and end over here um so like trying to connect stuff that's already been shot sometimes can be challenging and that's technically cinematic um and you're uh, practically you're kind of dubbing you're dubbing movement over yeah yeah exactly because you're right like sometimes they'll they'll have already done the voiceover and you're just trying to like hit beats of like where and sometimes they'll play the sound and then you they have to like play it over and over again you can kind of just like walk it through and stuff um but yeah that that stuff gets that gets that stuff gets technical and challenging we worked together on mortal kombat 11 um you did in-game and cinematics for that the cool thing about motion capture is that you can you know in editing and in post like you can just kind of take a movement like a fight and then put it wherever you want it so um just from the like technical standpoint i think that's really fascinating because a lot of what we did for Mortal Kombat specifically was like a lot of the battle scenes and you don't need a giant amount of people to like all be doing the same thing at once you can kind of tile little clumps of things so a lot of what we did for that was just like a bunch of short little fight vignettes that are kind of nondescript that they can put on whatever characters and but then I also did uh the movements like the in-game stuff for Sindel in the DLC um so that was that was different. That was kind of cool. That was one of the, like, we tried to make sure, like, we tried to bring back, because I guess she hadn't been in a few different games, and, like, we tried to bring back some of her moves from, like, when she originally existed, so I got to, like, figure out how to do the little back handspring, front handspring thing with a kick or whatever, and, like, 
keep that you know energy and and general vibe and um you know figure out what new movements or like what tricking stuff would would add into it and, and everything so it was kind of like stepping into an established character so that was kind of an interesting one did they give they give you some autonomy in coming up with some of that stuff a little um they were like we kind of want like this specific move and then like something spinny or kicky or whatever um and then i'd just like give them a couple options and they'd, they'd choose one um that kind of worked with it but we definitely like it was like a very 50 50 maybe less mix of like what i come up with and what already existed for that character which was really neat um and then working with them it's kind of the same like building the move sets it's just like you do the first move you go back you do the two moves then you go back and like building it all the way through to like whatever the amount of moves in the combo is which is a fun challenge in and of itself <laughs> You also worked on Raya as a fight consultant. Uh oh, talk about it. I want to hear everything. It, it was one day. Oh, it was one day. <laughs> um. Well, we like did a few days of like rehearsal and kind of came up with some fights and stuff. But then, uh, it was just reference stuff, which I always slightly resent. <laughs> um because you don't get any residuals or credit for it really um you get credit as like you know fight consultant um but the amount of stuff they get out of one day of work for you I uh, I don't like it um because they just video referenced everything um mm -hmm. and we just showed them like oh this is like what a Muay Thai fighter might look mm -hmm. like and like do this and then we showed them you know we came up with a lot of the choreography and stuff and you can kind of see the influence of it which is really neat um and I understand why you know they can't motion capture or credit people too much with like choreography and and movement because it's obviously animated and they're very like purists about it um but yeah like it's it's always funny to like be such a big part of something that you only worked on for a day Oh, the yeah. I'll, 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 I'll give you credit for the fights. Shoot. <laughs> yeah, it was a couple of different uh, people like Ma Maggie McDonald and um, Lauren Kim and Amy Johnston. It was fun. Like, I, you know, part of it, part of the like, not bitterness, but like part of the <laughs> unhappiness is like you wish you were a bigger part of it because it's such a cool project as well. Um, but you can't take too much credit because obviously like the animators did all of it and it's it's cool to be like the reference video you know but it definitely like you feel like you would want to be a bigger part of it just because especially with that one like the story is so cool and it did well and you know do you find that um where you have you know previs team a bunch of people do spend a lot of time doing previs and it might get used it might not get used but like how do you as a performer claim your work <laughs> in previs even in even in video games like how do you know that that's you right like because <laughs> i think it's the same as with motion capture because like they might have you do something and obviously it happened like four years ago by the time the game's out so i honestly kind of don't even remember what i did usually i'm like ah, i think i was there for that scene mostly I, I think that's when you just look at credits like if you're credited as fight choreographer that's all you <laughs> and like doesn't matter who actually made it up it just goes up the chain of command and like you know you could take all the credit for that whole thing yeah which in and of itself isn't necessarily the best fortunately it's a little bit of the nature of the beast at times and i remember like there was a guy that took credit for doing kratos's combat in god of war 2018 and uh and like a bunch of his fans they agreed they're like yeah awesome job and I think he worked on the game uh, for a couple of days and yeah. and I was like he might think he did like well, and, and so I looked at the credits and his name was in there along with 20 others of us and it's like yeah, yeah you you probably did you know and yeah. so did these other 19 but, people <laughs> you know people like there's two schools of thought on that whole thing of like it goes back to like stunts should stunts get Oscars and stuff but it's like oh, you're going to ruin the illusion of, you know, 
this actor being the character but on the other hand like doesn't makeup hair uh wardrobe location camera sound like all that also ruins the illusion because that actor couldn't do that without the cowboy hat or whatever so like and then on the other hand i think it's really nice especially in this day and age i don't know um to have people know what like how much teamwork goes into it i think more and more people want to know how stuff is made and i i don't think it would be a detriment to the project or the character or the finished story to have people understand that it's a big collaboration um so i try to like especially if people like ask especially about alita like there were 10 doubles for her like there was a skating double there was a contortionist double there was a main fight double mickey fashionello who did awesome did all the wire work and stuff there was like two other flippy doubles there was me um you know like duh one person isn't like the actor isn't gonna learn how to like roller skate like a pro where she can do jumps and turns and stuff in the three months of prep she has she's not gonna learn how to do crazy fights she's not gonna be able to do like hand balancing on one hand while like you know whatever and it's it's kind of cool to just you know tell people about that i think that's fantastic advice especially in new media now where like you said things get really muddled did you ever have a mentor getting into stunts um mike chat was a big influence because uh obviously I met him at, on the tournament circuit and stuff. And he was like, since I met him, he's like, come to LA, do stunts, do acting. Um, and you know, it was really cool of him to follow through on that when I, I did move. Cause I think he like invited me like a few years before I moved and he's like, yeah, you can like, you know, work at my school or whatever you can teach and stuff. And, um, I ended up hitting him up and teaching there for, you know, a couple of years when I was first, out here and that was super helpful um because you know obviously he understands the industry and like if I had an audition I could just be like hey I'm so sorry I can't come in like you know can you cover me or whatever and they always did so like that was amazing because I don't think any coffee shop or restaurant job would ever <laughs> kind of do that <laughs> um and then like you know you could do private lessons and I had a place to train so I could bring people in I had a key and everything and he introduced me to some people that you know gave me some really good work like Logan there's definitely people that have like helped me and that I learned a lot from like Manny's kind of one of them Michael Lair is also one of them a lot of the like indie fight people just you know you learn so much from them you know they know a lot of different aspects of of the filmmaking process and I think that's a quite a benefit in understanding how to perform for camera and everything um Mark Musashi also I took his uh, he had like a fight class at um, Gymnastics Olympica in LA for a while. And I took his class a lot. Um, and I liked the way it was set up because it was like, you could just do a whole bunch of different uh, levels of people like performance. Um, Cause he would just have one person do some choreography in the middle and everyone else around puttying. Cause you know, the uh, Power Rangers background and just kind of taking the reactions from afar. So everyone of different levels could just, work at the same speed and that class is where I really learned how to like because I from from sport karate like everything's fast everything's super sharp um so I just took the time that I was training in that class to just like flail and make everything super loose um for I think like a year I like really worked on just like making sure everything was just like very floppy um to counter just all the like super sharp sport karate stuff and then I kind of pulled it back from there and I think that helped immensely because I, I don't think I'd be the you know able to screen fight the way I do right now if I hadn't done that um so I'm super grateful to that class and then obviously like Dan Southworth who I still train with and you know some other people I'm sure I'll kick myself for not mentioning <laughs> oh and then Billy Bussy and Say King I trained with them for quite a bit and they like helped me a lot as well that's cool. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Clayton was my mentor and, uh, and I, I'm always curious because um, you kind of adopt the techniques, but then you adapt your own kind of learning to what those techniques were. So. Yeah. I think I always wanted like a one specific, like consistent mentor, but I never quite found one person. I just kind of like ended up learning different things from different people. It's honestly 
almost a benefit that I didn't have like one consistent mentor. I think now in hindsight, I, I like really wanted someone to just be like, this is how you do everything. Like for a while, you know, growing up and stuff, I, I think just everyone kind of goes through that, but it's, it's nice to be able to like pick and choose what works for you and, you know, like have different opinions on stuff. And it also just like helps you understand that there isn't one right way to do stuff, which some people I think get stuck in. Uh, last question. As a stunt performer, how do you stay fresh and keep learning new things? What keeps you interested? Currently, I am trying to like focus a little more onto um, like fight choreography and stuff. So I've been Thinking about that, I filmed a little like axe fight scene previs thing for a job that I, you know, didn't end up getting, but I'm glad I did it. And um, just kind of like trying to compile a demo reel of just like my choreography, filmed a sword fight in a forest. That was kind of fun. Still working on getting that edited. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to just like kind of being on the more creative side of the fight stuff i've started going more consistently to a jujitsu school um i have three stripes now so that's pretty cool <laughs> and it's nice to kind of just be back in a martial arts school with stunts there's always another skill that you can probably use like i have a friend who did high diving so i went and like did some flips off of a three meter board with her over the summer at a pool and just like it's it's random little things that i love the like learning curve of being a beginner because it's so much steeper especially if you have other background and like physical skills and stuff so that's always it's always fun to just like kind of go out and try new things any parting words just do what interests you and what you enjoy um within style within movement whatever um and just try to get really good at that and learn as much as you can about it because uh i think doing what you like um you're just going to go a lot further than, you know, trying to push something that you're not necessarily into because you think it's going to be beneficial. Like, obviously that's a part of it too. Like, you know, if you're trying to get into stunts and don't like falling, maybe work on that. But and within that, like, if you don't like motorcycles and you're like fighting, like focus on that. I think there's a lot more room for specialization these days. Um, so just, you know, doing what you like shows and you know it's got more longevity than trying to push into a direction that you don't love so yeah this will be really cool thanks so much for your time and thank you so much eric see you later bye